morning. Um, this begins our great celebration of the bicentennial of Kierkegaard today. And uh, what I want to talk to you about is his failed engagement. Now, Kierkegaard had four crises in his life that shaped him. His father, dealing with his father, was a very difficult episode in his life. Uh, he loved his father dearly, and he was deeply intimidated by him, and also disappointed in him. So it was a very difficult uh, episode. The second one was the engagement with Regine Olson that broke off after a year. The third was this argument he got in with a Corsair newspaper over review of his book, Stages on Lifeway. And then the last crisis had to do with the church, when he tangled uh, with the church after the, the death of Bishop Jacob Munster. So I, in my time working on Kierkegaard, I have ignored the engagement. I thought it was frivolous and kind of chick lit, you know, issue. It wasn't a substantial issue. But I gradually come to see that that is a, a complete mistake and that his broken engagement with Jean is very, very important. And one of the things that helped me was uh, reading this uh, book that surprised me in 2005, written by this uh, Carolyn O'Neill. And um, it's a historical novel about the engagement and, and the breaking of it and the resolution of that. And it's really a surprisingly good book. Um, so then I got back into it, and when I was working on the book on Kierkegaard, I decided to do an appendix, and that's what we have here, some copies of the appendix, for those of you who don't have the book. And that's why I want to go over this, 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 uh, this appendix too about regime with you today. So that's the plan for today. Uh, in this class is just to go through this, uh, this appendix number two um, on the issue of regime. So I want to start with the end of the, um, of the uh, uh, appendix with the last footnote, footnote 70, um, uh, 73 actually. Uh, and it tell, regime tells, I mean, uh, Carolyn uh, Coleman O'Neill tells a little bit about herself. She says, um, O'Neill dedicates uh, her novel to her father for bringing us up on Søren Kierkegaard and to my mother for not. <laughs> How's about that? So also the online inter see also the online interview with Carolyn where she says, I was raised on Søren Kierkegaard's philosophy. My father became a born-again Christian in his early 40s by reading Søren Kierkegaard and he was quoted in our home as often as the Bible. But I found Søren's renunciation of the world far too extreme and I resisted reading him. Later, when spending seven years writing the novel Loving Cern, I traveled to Copenhagen. I went to the Danish West Indies, which is now the U.S. Virgin Islands. I read extensively. I read biographies. I read contemporary accounts. I read over two-thirds of Kierkegaard's works. So she had this very interesting childhood with Kierkegaard, kind of rejected him, and then came back to him later in life. And so she, she wrote this, uh, this book, uh, Loving Cern. And the book's out of print, uh, but you can find copies on Amazon.com. They're very, very affordable. So I just want to talk a little bit about this engagement. So Regine Olson in Copenhagen was about nine years younger than Kierkegaard. They were engaged in 1840, and they broke it off a year later at CERN's wishes. Regine did not want to break it off. Um, and there are two basic reasons why people think this happened, because there is no definitive account in Kierkegaard's works on why it happened. There are two basic reasons why they think it happened, and then there are four other reasons <laughs> that have been considered. And so I am of the view that it's the sixth reason that is most compelling. So I want to start out with the two standard reasons um, for breaking it off. And by the way, let me say, um, that I think this is all worth um, thinking about with Kierkegaard because it helps explain his books. If it doesn't help explain his book and his authorship, then I think it is you know, not a significant use of our time. But I think it helps us understand the books because we need to remember that the, the engagement broke off in 1841 and Kierkegaard really started writing big time in 1843. 
And then he wrote for 12 years, wrote about 30 books. It was just a fury of writing. Sometimes he wrote three, four books in a year. And he dedicated them all to her. It's kind of his muse. See? So if you think this is all kind of irrelevant, um, as I did for a long time, you're missing the fact that he dedicated all of his books to her and his father. But uh, he thought especially uh, of her, very significant in writing the books. So it's worth uh, dwelling on. Now, what were the two basic reasons for breaking off the engagement? And these are the, kind of the official reasons by the intelligentsia. Okay? The first one is that uh, Kierkegaard would be too difficult to live with. He, uh, he was a difficult personality. And so, uh, out of love for Regine, he broke it off because he thought he would just destroy her. Uh, the relationship would be so difficult. He suffered from melancholy, and so he didn't think he'd support her the way that he would need to as a husband. At one time, he says, I don't think I could be a good husband for anybody. It, it isn't really Regine's fault. It's just the way I am. Okay? So that's one, one explanation. The second explanation is that... Kierkegaard had no time for it. He was busy doing other things. Like what? <laughs> Writing his books. He would spend all day as kind of a dandy walking the streets of Copenhagen in his top coat and his uh, top hat and he would chit chat with anybody and he would smoke cigars and he would drink coffee at the cafes and he would talk about the weather, he'd talk about anything. He didn't talk about anything profound. He was a dandy. And then, at the end of the day, when people would go home to have their dinner and go to, go to bed, Kierkegaard would go home and start writing. And he had three standing writing desks in his house, and he would walk around the house all night, keep himself awake, going from desk to desk, writing these books. And then periodically a great big book would appear with his name on it, either responsible for publication or signed. He had two uh, authorships going simultaneously. And these books would appear with his name on it. And the people who he drank coffee with in the cafe said, it's not possible. The guy's just a, you know, a dandy. What, how could he write these? Some of the books are great big, fat books. And they were very profound uh, dealing with uh, George Hegel's philosophy and stuff like that. He said, how could this man be writing books like that? So this is, um, this is what he did. He had no time for marriage. <laughs> Honey, are you, when are you coming to bed? <laughs> I'll be there just after I get the last part of concluding unscientific postscript to the philosophical fragments, honey. <laughs> so anyway, um, these are the two standard reasons. I don't think either of them tell the story. So let's look at four other possible reasons. Third one, Kierkegaard didn't want to be too happy, and being married would make him happy. He didn't think we were here on this earth to be happy. We are here on this earth to be faithful disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ, and my marriage to Regine, who I deeply love, I deeply love her, would be, um, would be bad for me, because it would make me too happy. So he basically had to tell Regine, we're not getting married because you would make me too happy. And Regine, and, and uh, uh, O'Neill does a good job in the novel about this. Uh, Regine looks at him and says, oh, sir, you need me all the more. <laughs> you need me all the more. Do you think that's a reason not to get married? For Pete's sakes, you see? So uh, anyway, that's worth thinking about for a minute, isn't it? What is, um, what is the point? of Christianity. Is the point to make us happy? Or is the point to make us faithful, even if being faithful may not make us happy? So I begin the little appendix, page one. Kierkegaard argued that the Christian life is sheer agony, an agony compared with which all of the human sufferings are almost childish pranks. And the footnote says, the truth is to become a Christian is to become humanly speaking unhappy for this life the proportion is, the more you're involved yourself with God, the more He loves you, the more you will become, humanly speaking, unhappy for this life, the more you will come to suffer in this life. Now that is a very contentious view of Christianity. And it's a hallmark 
of Kierkegaard's understanding of Christianity. The centrality of suffering. Well, what is he suffering about? Missing the sale at Nordstrom's? Doggone it! What is he suffering about? He's languishing in his soul over the failure of us living a life with God. That's where the source of the suffering is. The failure of us living a life with God. We don't live life with God. We live a life with everything else under the sun, but not with God. And living our life with God, following His Word, being excited about His direction and guidance for our life, is it goes begging. And so the Christian then uh, is sad and unhappy. Even if your little corner of the world is going fairly well, you can't possibly let that just float above everything else that's happening in the world that is distressing. Not only is it this failure to live life with God distressing, but Kierkegaard also is very worried about how we treat each other. How do we treat each other? We do not treat each other well. We do not treat each other well. And so those two things added up produce this terrible suffering. And so um, to just be happily married and to enjoy this relationship with this other person who is your soulmate and the world can just go merrily along to hell in a handbasket or whatever because, you know, Hans and Lena are happy. You know? And, that, and that's all about... Kierkegaard found that to be a huge travesty. Okay? A huge travesty. So, um, at one point he says, if you do want to get married, then maybe a good idea is to uh, have a terrible marriage. That would be a way of having your cake and eat it too. <laughs> so if you go to page 317, he talks about Socrates' wife, Xantippe. Okay, Xantippe is famous for being kind of a shrew. And uh, so if you look at footnote 18 on page 317, with nostalgia, Kierkegaard notes in his journals a couple of years before he died, to date 12 years since I became engaged. See? So he held on to that memory. He loved Regine and the thought of marrying her, but couldn't do it. Even so, Kierkegaard was no hopeless romantic. He believed that the best marriages were the difficult ones, like that of his hero Socrates to his fiery wife Xantippe. And this is what we learn about Xantippe. To be married the way Socrates was is something quite different from what is generally understood by marriage. Socrates saw in marriage a hindrance, and for that reason married, and for that reason was happy with Xantippe, or counted himself fortunate, namely because of the difficulty, so writes Kierkegaard. And then, um, in uh, Schaeffer's book on great philosophers who failed at love, he writes, in stark contrast to the submissive lives that women were expected to leave, live in ancient Greece, Xantippe publicly berated her elderly husband. According to one legend, after a heated verbal exchange between the couple, Xantippe poured dirty water from a pail on her husband's head. Socrates knew that he had it coming to him, joking that it generally rains after thunder. <laughs> so, uh, this is, um, you may say, this is like rubbing salt in the wound, wouldn't you? You know? where you say, yeah, you can get married, but make sure you're not happy in your marriage. Then it would be okay, because there's something <coughs> deeply wrong about being happy, especially in your marriage. So you got that little bit of a, of a, uh, of a compromise. Um, but uh, Kierkegaard did love uh, Regine. Uh, and in uh, page 319, um, we have a line out of the book, the Carolyn uh, O'Neill book, um, where um, she says she threw herself fully clothed on her bed, her body was still trembling, a husband, baby's happiness, all this was within her grasp. She could hardly stand herself. Would her children look like CERN? Would they have wild blonde hair, piercing blue eyes? Would they be sharp as tacks, gadflies? Her sons might be, but not her daughters. They would be kind and thoughtful, brown-haired and brown-eyed. Later, after Kierkegaard dies, Regine even admits that he was more important to her than anything else, even God. So that's another problem, right? You become too happy with this world, then you lose all taste, all impetus, all inspiration, all desire for that one thing that is needful. And that's another big threat 
that's there in being happy in this life. So, um, um, <clears throat> we have a, a line here from Kierkegaard, if I can find it, um, about his love for, for her. Um, I think we'll move on, though, and, and, and uh, get to that later. Now, um, uh, what is the fourth alternative? And talk a little bit about happiness there. What is the fourth explanation on why Kierkegaard didn't get married? Because Kierkegaard lacked faith. With God, all things are possible, right? He knew with God all things are possible. So why can't I be married and be happy and also be sad about all the trouble in the world? Why can't I do both? So he says, at one point he said, if I had more faith, I would have married her. If I believed that with God all things are possible, I would have married her. Um, so on page uh, 323, um, Footnote 51. After five years after their breakup, Kierkegaard finally confesses in his journal, for God, all things are, for God all things are possible. This thought is now, in the deepest sense, my watchword, and has gained a meaning for me which I had never envisioned. Just because I see no way out, I must never have the audacity to say that therefore there is none for God. For it is despair and blasphemy to confuse one's little crumb of imagination and the like with the possibilities that God has at his disposal. And if you go up into the text where that footnote 51 is, about eight lines down in the text, he says, If I had had faith, I would have stayed with regime. My sin is that I did not have faith, faith that for God all things are possible. But where is the borderline between that and tempting God? But my sin has never been that I did not love her. What in the world does that mean? What does that mean? He said, where's the borderline between what and what? The, the borderline between believing that with God all things are possible and you can do this and still be a faithful disciple of the Lord and the, the view that we are here to suffer in this life. Slogging through the bog, as he says, with the difficulties in our own challenges and in the difficulties in our inner relation, our relations with other people. See that uh, we are to be on that path of suffering and, and difficulty. And yet, with God all things are possible, so we should be able to be happy in our married life and then also um, uh, struggle in the world. He said, where is the borderline? How do these two things fit together? He said, if I had faith, I could have married her, but then again, how would I have um, been um, faithful to the call to suffer? So, that's a fourth one. And now we have the fifth one. The fifth one is uh, Kierkegaard's impotence. Uh, some of the uh, women uh, Kierkegaard scholars uh, especially uh, got into this question that the reason Kierkegaard broke off the engagement was that he was uh, impotent, uh, that he was he would not able to, been able to consummate the marriage, and so uh, rather than uh, marrying her and then her discovering that they weren't able to enter into the coital embrace and have children or to enjoy each other's um, presence sexually, he broke off the engagement, and there are a series of passages that are elliptical where he talks about his broken body. And so that has led uh, the, uh, the great biography of Kierkegaard, this Joachim Garf, to say that about him, that that's probably why it broke off. And now, uh, for the advice and tenant, Joachim Garf has also put together a big book on um, uh, Kierkegaard and Regine and the failed engagement. So it'll be interesting to see what else he's come up with there. I think that view is faulty. And I think it's faulty because of what uh, Kierkegaard has to say about himself in regard to it. So if you go to page 326, uh, Sian Leon's uh, book on this, uh, both and the uh, 
kind of the sexuality of Sir Kierkegaard. So he's actually written a book on that. Um, I say, while well, Leon's thesis, right in the middle of page 326, has some basis in fact, most of it is fueled by speculations beyond the fact. Kierkegaard did say, after all, that he could have easily secured for himself a very comfortable life with regime, but that he felt something greater was being demanded of him. This confidence works squarely against any concern there might be over any sort of imagined sexual dysfunction on Kierkegaard's part. So I don't see uh, much there at all. So that's five. And now the last one, which I think is why he broke it up. Number six, Kierkegaard wanted to make regime famous. And if he had married her, she would have been Mrs. Kierkegaard. And that'd be the end of it. But he wanted to make her famous. And guess what? Huh, he did it! Uh, he made her famous. And she lived to be 80, around 80, 82. And she, she died in 1904. Um, and uh, she saw Kierkegaard's fame in Germany. Kierkegaard was not famous in his lifetime in Copenhagen. His work was basically ignored. He really didn't uh, gain any kind of ascendancy in world literature until about 100 years after he died. Uh, in the 1930s, so his books started being translated more widely. Uh, but Germany was the first to notice him. And Regine knew about that. And there were German scholars who came and talked to her and interviewed her. And she wrote memoirs about her life with him. And we have those. And those are in translation, so you can read those. Uh, Bruce Kermsky's uh, book, um, Kierkegaard Seen by His Contemporaries, has uh, those, uh, and they're very, they're very, faci very fascinating uh, memoirs that she wrote. She became famous, and, and, and she experienced the fame. So uh, this is what he did, for what reason? Well, two reasons he apparently did this. One was, he felt she was greater that people would notice. She was a very uh, diminutive person, and she was very pretty, and uh, she uh, uh, would be recognized for that, but Kierkegaard thought she was more than that. So he wanted her to have some fame beyond uh, her appearance. Um, so that, that was one reason. The other reason was he wanted to thank her. Thank her for what? Being the inspiration being the inspiration for his books and also for his life and his, um, his faith in God, if you can believe this. So let's go to page 326. Um, fame. So, for whatever reasons, Kierkegaard broke off his engagement to Regine. His goal was clearly to set her free. He wanted to honor her in this way because he felt he owed his best to her, that she was the occasion for his most creative endeavors. And so he dedicated all of his writings to her and his father, an old man's wisdom and a woman's lovable lack of understanding, the lovable tears of her misunderstanding. That's how she inspired him. Isn't this strange? She... She didn't inspire him by giving him his ideas. She inspired him by challenging him to be clearer. Because he was always wondering, could Regine understand this? So uh, that, that's the lovable tears of her misunderstanding. So um, she was, uh, she became kind of an invisible persona behind all the books. And at one point, Kierkegaard uh, talks about falling in love with his pen. And my view on that is that it's a cipher. It's a stand-in for Regine herself. So in this letter he wrote to his cousin, Julie Thompson, and in footnote 60 on page 326, he writes, I'm actually in love with the company of my pen. <laughs> well, that'll teach you to break off your engagement. <laughs> I'm actually in love with the company of my pen. It might be said that this is a poor object on which to cast one's affection. Well, at least you know he's not crazy, because he understands how stupid it sounds. So he's, he, he, he seems to have his wits about him. It might be said that this is a poor object on which to cast one's affections. Perhaps, he says, 
He's not completely convinced. Maybe it is a good idea to love your pen. So he says, um, perhaps, but it is not as though I were always content with it. Occasionally I hurl it away in anger. Alas, this very anger shows me once more that I am indeed in love with it, for the quarrel ends as lover quarrels do. As lover quarrels do. See, that's a hint to me that this is regime. The pen. She's become the pen. As lover quarrels do, I can fight completely in my pen. Whether I become angry when it sometimes seems to me that it cannot do what I can do, so I can't get my words out. You maybe have experienced that. I'd like to put this down, my thoughts, but I can't quite get the right words. So I confide completely in my pen whether I am angry when it sometimes seems to me that it cannot do what I can do, cannot follow the thought that I am thinking, or, he says, look at this, or whether I'm surprised when it seems as if it can do what I cannot do. That's how regime is the muse. When he's thinking about her tears of misunderstanding, <coughs> he then pushes himself to be clearer. And my guess is that some of Kierkegaard's clearest moments are when he moves off of the discursive writing to his analogical writing, when he comes up with these parables, when he comes up with these images. They're just, they're, they're just brilliant. And I had a teacher one time who said, all the great philosophers traded well in images, from Plato's cave image, you know, all the way up to you know uh, other images that philosophers have used. Um, Peter uh, Strawson, a British philosopher, talks about philosophy having no deep end in the swimming pool. I mean, no shallow end in the swimming pool. You just jump in the deep end. You can't gradually work yourself up in philosophy. So I mean, these guys are always trying to come up with these images. And Kierkegaard did the same thing. And I think it was inspired by regime so that he would end up, these would come to him in flashes, these images. and. Um, I think that was when he learned he could write more than he knew with his pen. And then he says, I cannot tear myself away from the company of my pen. Indeed, it even prevents me from seeking the company of anybody else, which also suggests to me that regime is his pen. So when I read that, I said, I want a drawing of this. I want a drawing of this. I think it's that important. And so I Googled. Seattle illustrators, and Heather Hudson popped up. I think Heather's going to be here today. And uh, I gave her this little letter of Julie Thompson, and I said, I'd like an illustration of this. And she said, well, I don't know anything about Kierkegaard, and I think you're just a little off your rocker. <laughs> <laughs> but she says, I like the letter. She said, there's something about that resonates in me. And uh, so she, she said, I'll give you four possible uh, renditions of this. I gave her one idea. I also, you know, I'm not an illustrator, but I had a little idea. It was dorky, you know. So she, one of the four was my dorky idea, and then she had three others. And this one that's in the book, on the page there, it was her. I think it was her fourth uh, uh, proposal. And I said, "That's it. That's it." And so she then, uh, isn't it great though? And there she is. She's behind the quill, and she kind of sh shows through the quill. The quill's kind of uh, invisible. And then his hand. You know, and then the ink splot is a broken heart, <laughs> and a nice effect. And um, the only thing, my only beef with it, I just love the curls and, and her, her bow. That's that's from a picture, and her eyes. I just think she captured the eyes wonderfully well. But the hand was too muscular, because Kierkegaard is probably a very slight person. And uh, she said, "Yeah, well, maybe so, but his writings are muscular." <laughs> so. Yeah, I can see. I can see. So, uh, so there it is. Um, and uh, so he wanted to make uh, her famous, um, and he did it. Um, now, Carolyn O'Neill, in her book, on page three twenty-eight, she talks about um, regime's uh, failure. Um, so look at uh, footnote 63. This is just what Regine needed to brighten up her dismal life, just as Kierkegaard imagined and planned for. On her gloomy life, O'Neill and Loving Stern writes, she was a failure. Her life had been nothing but a string of failures, a broken engagement, a dead father, a sick mother, a dead baby, a dead marriage, and now a dead fiance. That's how O'Neill puts it. Um, 
So uh, Kierkegaard did a wonderful thing for her by not marrying her and by making her famous in order to help her and also to thank her for all that she did for him and his writings. So um, I think that the two standard views, that he's too difficult to be with and they had no time for it, I think are superficial myself. I think there are marriages where that is the case and they're fine marriages. Where people are difficult, unfortunately my wife's here right now. <laughs> where people are difficult and we still somehow manage to get along. Jay and I got along for 41 years. Thank God Almighty, thank God Almighty. Uh, and then uh, they have no time for it. Well, it's amazing how even though you're busy, people still can be married and still love each other, enjoy each other's company. So I think these are superficial. They're the two standard reasons given. And then uh, the thing about being too happy, I think doesn't really describe the cause for the broken engagement because that's a general statement about Christianity, whether you're married or not. Okay, so it's not, it, it's not specific enough. And then that he lacked the faith, I think that also, by the very statements, Kierkegaard himself was a dialectical issue there for him, how he compared it with its opposing points of view, and he worked on that, again, as a general statement about the Christian life, so it's not specific enough. The thing about it being impotent, I don't think there's any basis in fact, and so the last one then, by default, I'd say, is the statement about fame. Now, the book, um, Loving Cern, really ends wonderfully well on uh, this question of fame for Regine, and how she thought of Kierkegaard, and how uh, he should be uh, regarded. So at the end of the book, uh, there's this fictitious character that she invents, Eleanor, who's an elderly woman, who meets with Regine in the, in the, in the uh, Dutch East Indies, and discovers how famous she is, that she is the muse for Kierkegaard, and she's read all of Kierkegaard's books. And they start talking about him, what a cranky person he was, and how he was so, um, he could be kind of mean, and he was uh, so concerned about the unhappiness of life, and melancholy and all this. And uh, uh, Eleanor says to Regine, it might be worth reconsidering. It might be re worth reconsidering. There is something great about living through difficulties that strengthens us and builds character. And while they don't give any credit to Kierkegaard on this, because uh, he's kind of dismissed at the end, these two women are talking about the place of suffering in life and how, even though it was very hard on Regine, that there, were, there was a silver lining on the cloud. And so there was something beneficial. So I thought the way the book ends is a backhanded compliment to Kierkegaard without saying it straightforward. That he was right, that we were wrong. They, they don't say that. They say he was kind of cranky, he was difficult to be with, um, and then they kind of independently look at this business of suffering, how you deal with suffering, forgiving people who hurt you. It's really quite an interesting end of the book, and I think it's really the, the strength of the book. Um, and then I end by adding something to this about, this is really the way Kierkegaard should be remembered. Because he was very interested in indirection over direct. And, and direct statements. Direct statements came to the fore more at the end of his life, but at the beginning, and, and the bulk of his writings, he really did pursue this mode of indirection so that he wouldn't say things straightforward in order to try to draw you in. And it looks like he's done a fairly good job of it because he does have readers worldwide. And his books have been translated to almost every language of the world. And the people who read him are baffled by him, but they can't stop reading him. So that's the thing about indirection, not just saying it point blank. So people read him and try to tease out what he had to say because it's not directly on the page there for the most part. There are statements of his that are very direct, but for the most part he had this great facility being indirect. So I think it's a kind of a fitting um, praise for him. And then there are actual statements of his that he made about not wanting to be praised. I'd like to end with that. Um, and we may have some questions if you'd like. Um, so on page uh, 329, um, this might read that, the last page here. Um, Regine is moved by Eleanor and resolves to take up the hard work of forgiving Soren all over again. So it's the top of the page after the indented. 
After Regine goes through a long private litany of things to forgive Cern for, the book ends with the line, but there was a more excellent way, a way of pain. This is largely derived from Eleanor's early assessment of Kierkegaard's books. I read Cern Kierkegaard, Eleanor said, pursing her lips when I feel depressed about being stuck out here in this dreadful heat. I've never met a man who understood doom and gloom so perfectly. That's Cern Kierkegaard, all right, Fritz said. He looked at Regina. Doom and gloom. Eleanor threw up her fleshly arms. Yes, as I've decided, he must be the most narcissistic, vacillating, self-centered man who ever walked the planet. Just then, almost, if he knows he's gone too far, he says something so profound and beautiful that I feel sympathy for him and keep going. Do you know what I mean? Well, er, yes, Fritz said. He cast another worried glance at Regina. So even though Regina and Eleanor pretty well rake CERN over the coals, at the end of the novel, it nevertheless ends on a decidedly Kierkegaardian note about the salutary nature of pain, without ever directly vindicating Kierkegaard himself. But the oblique way of showing respect for what he wrote is just as it should be for Kierkegaard, for any Kierkegaardian for that matter. And that is because Kierkegaard knew if only one were to make a big fuss, if anyone were to make a big fuss over him with accolades, honors, and undying praise, his cause would be ruined. And then, um, verse, uh, I mean, footnote 70 at the bottom page, this was because Kierkegaard believed that Christianity has been harmed incalcul incalculably by being given a deep bow and meaningful respect. <laughs> that's great. I think that's great. For, and then back into the text, for his plan was never to get ahead in this world, but rather to be as insignificant as possible. The proper motto for my life, Kierkegaard adds, would then be this. No one puts a new patch on an old garment. The opposite is the wisdom of the prudent, who therefore are on good terms with the present moment. That is, they place their little smidge of improvement directly upon the established order. And on that little smidge, I have footnote 72, that same little smidge is all that Kierkegaard sees in book reviews. <laughs> Wait, he praise books or down, you know. He says, for... Um, uh, he says, I reject all reviews, for to me a reviewer is just as loathsome as a street barber's assistant who comes running with his shaving water, which is used for all customers, and fumbles about my face with his clammy fingers. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a die-hard author. Never how, does, uh, how does his last attempts to contact her fit into your scheme, because uh, that always strikes me as kind of a pathetic thing in his life, yeah. that he tried to see her, mm -hmm. and she didn't want to see him, which makes perfectly good sense, mm -hmm. uh, but how does that, how would you put that into your scheme? Yeah, I would say that it um, is a, uh, it's a foible in the, uh, the sixth uh, reason. This was his sixth reason, but that there was something undecided about it. There was something that he couldn't live with exactly, which kind of fits with the tumultuous life that he had. So every time he would arrive at something he was sure about, he would reconsider. So I think the efforts to see her and try to make amends, um, where he would kind of back off of what he was doing and why he was doing it. And then he would catch himself. Like when he would go and look for her at the, at the church, and he would see her, and then he was going to go and talk to her, and then he wouldn't do it, and he would leave. You know, that's kind of the pathetic part of it for me. I don't know if that's what you're referring to. But I think that was just part of the, the lack of, of resolution. That would be my, uh, my thought there. It is a, it, they, they are interesting, those episodes. And Garth makes a big deal out of those, because he thinks... It was all about the um, the sexual failure and wanting to give it another go, see if somehow he can make this thing work. Um, any other questions or yes? Yeah. I'm trying to understand the timeline. Yeah. He says he had no time for it. He didn't start reading or writing, mm -hmm. or was he writing before that? He, he was, was writing before. Okay. He actually started writing, I think, in '39, something like that. But '43 is when Either Or came out two great big books, and when six of his edifying discourses came out, and it was the beginning of the two tracks of publication that went side by side. 
all the way up to uh, 1851 or so, 52. So um, that's, um, it's, it's a little difficult to talk about when he starts, right? Because uh, what most people say in 43, the whole vision for the authorship was set. And it seems to, it's like he had the whole thing kind of planned. He got to 46 and thought about scrapping it and then went back to the plan and then took it through uh, 1851. And uh, almost all the books were finished by then, except for a couple of them. So he may have foresaw what was coming up and that's why he wrote the book. That's hard, I don't know. That's a good question, I don't know. If he's two doesn't make much sense if you know, he broke up and then started the writing two years later. Yeah. Well, the other thing about him is that um, there's a, actually a third track of writing, and that's the journals. And so he experiments with his books and his journals. So there are large sections of some of his books and his journals that he then takes later and publishes them and revises them. He was not one of these writers like Mozart in composing his symphonies where it just through composition, where there's no corrections on the score. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, you heard the sentence, wrote it down. Kierkegaard wasn't that way. We have some of his manuscripts, and he'll have his text, and then he'll cross things out, and he'll draw pictures over him, and he'll run circles, and, and just, the whole thing just looks like a mad child. His pages. So while the first publication was 43, he was writing before. So maybe that's the best answer to your question. Yes, Bob. So um, you you've offered uh, reason number six here in the in the international Kierkegaard conversation amongst scholars. Yeah. Any response to that? Yeah. Well, uh, the two new. Yeah, um, Robert Perkins, who I dedicate the book to, who is the editor of the International Kierkegaard Commentary, and four of my essays appeared in that, and he's really the one responsible for the publication of the book. He insisted on me putting it together and trying to publish it, and I said, I don't think anybody wants it, you know. And, and indeed, six publishers turned it down, and then he was dogged, 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 dogged. So he wanted to see it, and he finally found Whiff and Stock down in Eugene, Oregon for me, and that's the, the other people who published it. But uh, Dr. Perkins thinks it's great. He loves the appendix, too. I haven't heard from anybody else. Probably won't. I, I do not know Danish, and I do not have credentials. I don't have a PhD degree, and I do not teach at universities. I'm not in the academy. So that kind of disqualifies you as a voice. Well, do you want to know? Do I not know what they think? Or do you uh, keep it with Kierkegaard and footnote 72? Yeah. No, I don't particularly want to know. <laughs> want to, want to, want to find out if the reviewer has read uh, the yeah. I, you know, not really. Uh, it would be nice, um, but uh, it's not a big interest. I'm moving on. I'm now working on all of Kierkegaard's comments on Luther's sermons, which are considerable, and I think it's a whole new part of Kierkegaard research. I just found a guy in Nebraska who wrote a dissertation on the very topic. So he and I are in conversation now. So I'm, I'm, that's what I'm excited about right now. So. Anything else on Regine and CERN? These star-crossed lovers that never have a life together. There's that one strange passage in here mm -hmm. later on, I have a quote, uh, where he imagines that when they die, that all three of them will be in heaven together. Regine and her husband, Fritz Schlegel, and Sir, some <laughs> heavenly threesome. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's just it's bizarre, isn't it? But uh, he hoped that somehow that he would have a life with her in heaven. Um, so uh, I don't think anybody besides Elizabeth Kubler-Ross thinks that that'll actually be physical yeah. coitus. <laughs> I think she's actually yeah. talked about that at the end. Yeah. So at any rate, that's a very strange statement. Anything else? Do you see Donna in our house here? Yes, I surely do see Donna. Isn't that wonderful? So glad that Donna's here. Uh, her husband, George, God rest his soul, was an inspiration for this book. In fact, I talked to George in the 90s about doing it. I had one essay at the time, a very contentious essay on self-hatred. And so I took it to George and said, you know, am I way off base here? And George read it and he said, no, you're not. He said, I have a few suggestions on how you can make it stronger. And he said, I think you should also send it to Howard Hong, have him read it, which I did, and, and Howard made some suggestions. 
And so I was very excited. And, and, uh, and I told, I asked uh, George, I said, well then, if the, if the book ever does come out, would you be willing to write the um, forward to it? He said, I'd love to. So I was all excited about it. That was quite a day, that meeting with George. <laughs> when he said that, you know, and I, I got all that correspondence, I keep that, and I read it periodically, go back and read George's letters to me about the book. So I'm so glad that uh, his widow Donna is with us today. Raise your hand, Donna. <laughs> so everybody knows who you are. Thank you, thank you. And Don is also in a big donors for the statue. Yes. Uh, just a point of information. Speaking of the Hobbes and Fear and Trembling, yeah. I saw a reference to an annotated Fear and Trembling. Mm -hmm. Is is that the version that's always been in French for Princeton, or is this a new book that you might be aware of? I think that is it. That's not the Reader's Guide to Fear and Trembling. Uh, I saw it only as annotated. Yeah, I think it's the Reader's Guide. So it's actually the, the author's interpretation of Fear and Trembling. Yeah. By the Hongs? No, the Hongs are both gone now. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So it, it's something new. Um, we we read Fear and Trembling uh, yeah. in our in our fall uh, Sunday morning class. So we yeah. spent two months on it, and uh, it's great to read that again. A lot of people that's about all they know about Kierkegaard is reading Fear and Trembling. I read it as a freshman in college, <coughs> and uh, couldn't make sense out of it all. Yeah, I didn't. I don't think I understood a word. Same here. And I didn't understand a word. It's such a short little book, and some of the sections are real short, like a page long. And I didn't have a clue what he was talking about. And I went into the class as a young Christian man thinking I could understand this. It's about the near sacrifice of Isaac in Genesis 22. And I read that book, and I not only didn't understand the book, but then I didn't understand Genesis 22 anymore. <laughs> so I put that away, and then didn't read them again for six years. I went to the seminary, and there was like one teacher there, Paul Sponheim, who had written on Kierkegaard for his dissertation and taught Kierkegaard. And so I took uh, classes from him on Kierkegaard and studied with him, but he was kind of a Hegelian uh, Kierkegaard scholar. He thought that Kierkegaard and Hegel were much closer, and that Kierkegaard is more of a philosopher in the sense of Hegel than uh, normally thought. And uh, I argued with him the whole time I was there, and when I left, I realized that I just couldn't buy that view either. So my second go around at Kierkegaard was I put him away, I didn't want to read him anymore. Because I, I don't like Hegel's philosophy of the historical dialectic where everything works itself out naturally through the thesis, antithesis, and synthesis. I don't think that's true. I think there's genuine disruptions and unsolved matters. I mean, I just could hardly believe that Hegel could write anything like that and that people would believe it. So then, just through a quirk, uh, I ended up with the journals in 78. And uh, my dear old dad, I can hardly believe it, bought me the whole set of journals down in L.A. And he and I didn't get along about, didn't agree on anything. But he decided one night he wanted to buy me some books. And so the, the seven volumes from Indiana University and Press just come out. So he put up the 350 bucks, bought the books. And I remember the day they showed up on the stoop in L.A. And I opened up the box, the big one, stayed up all night, read them. Now those, that selection of the journals, which was nearly complete, was all arranged by topic. And so you could just go to a topic, faith, suffering, uh, creation, prayer, and had everything that Kierkegaard and his journals all sorted out, and little snippets, and they were just delicious for me. So that's what finally got me with the journals. And then I went and read the published works. So I did it backwards. But I often do that. Sometimes I read a book backwards. I just start at the end, see where the guy ends up, or where she ends up, and then start the beginning, and I feel relaxed. I know where it's ending up, and I don't have to, the intrigue is all gone, and I can just kind of savor it and go through slowly. So that's how I did it with Kierkegaard. Anything else on this failed engagement? Thank you so much for being here, and I hope you enjoy the festivities the rest of the day. And I hope you have a chance to meet Rita and Donna, and uh, just so I'm glad they're here. And, and um, the service is going to be wonderful. We have Kierkegaard's favorite hymn by Paul Gerhardt, Commit Thy Way, Confiding. It's been out of circulation for years and years and years. And Carl Shaw, 84 years old, south of Chicago, has written a new tune for it. And it will be first sung today. So we'll be able to sing Kierkegaard's favorite hymn. It's a great hymn. The text is just great. And the tune is wonderful. And then a friend of my, uh, my second daughter, Ruth, a New York City composer, has taken two pages out of uh, 
Christian discourses on, on certainty of the, of the message of Christianity, the uncertainty of our appropriation of it, and has written a fugue, a five-minute fugue for uh, cello and tenor voice. And, uh, and again, Ruth and Christopher will be um, presenting that uh, during the, um, the distribution music for Holy Communion. And I heard it yesterday for the first time. They rehearsed yesterday for the first time. It's just unbelievable. I, I hope you love it. I just, uh, and you'll have the text in your bulletin so you can go through the words, because the words are fairly complicated about this dialectic, this fugal voices back and forth about certainty and uncertainty, which I think is really the heart of the Christian experience, isn't it? The words are very clear, but we have a heck of a time living by them. Uh, so. And then afterwards, it's going to be a lot of fun in the basement. <laughs> I'll just tell you that. So we're going to dedicate the statue, and we're going to read the commemorative poem at the dedication, and then we're going to go to the basement and have uh, some treats and uh, some wonderful dancing. So I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.